In this presentation, I want to talk about a little political psychology, and in particular, I'm going to talk about what Jervis has to say about understanding beliefs. Beliefs and his discussion of them are kind of at the foundation of his work on political psychology, and political psychology in general is important for us in studying cultures, so we understand, you know, if, if culture is, at, as Geert Hofstetter says, software of the mind, then understanding how the mind works is very important for understanding how cross-cultural situations might get in the way. So we're going to start here by talking about understanding beliefs, what beliefs are, what role they play, and all the references here are from Jervis's book, How Statesmen Think, The Psychology of International Politics. Okay, the nature of belief. Now it's very important to understand the beliefs that we're talking about here are beliefs about the world. They're beliefs about facts, particularly cause and effect relationships. And they go to the answering several questions about the world that are important. How do things work? Why do others act as they do? So much is about expectations of what people do and, un and also interpreting why they did something, okay? Also consequences. What are, going, what are the consequences of one's behavior going to be? We need to keep in mind that very often the consequences of behavior are not governed by physics as much as, you know, the physical sciences, as much as by social factors, right? How will people react? What will their thing be? So there's a lot going on here. There, but the key thing is we aren't talking about grand beliefs about God or metaphysics or, you know, the meaning of the universe. We're talking about beliefs about the way the world is. Now, it's very important. You know, I think throughout this, the intercultural relations point of view is going to be that people from different cultures may answer the questions, these questions above very differently. And, you know, I'm not going to come back to this too much because I think it's going to, it should be obvious that when we're talking about beliefs and Jervis is not talking about interculture, he's talking about how beliefs of people presumably from our same culture might be difficult to understand or interpret or, or work with. When we talk about people from other cultures, we obviously are talking about folks who have beliefs that are, are perhaps different than our own. And so it exacerbates this. But I think in general, the relevance of everything that follows will be pretty clear. Now, another thing about beliefs, and, and here's a quote I really like. Uh, he has a lot of little good one-liners. People adopt opinions not only to understand the world, but also to meet the psychological and social needs to live with themselves and others. He comes back to this, right, that we live in a world with other people. We have psychological needs, right? And there's a thing called ontological security, right? Ontology is about what exists, right? And it's basically the answers to those questions, right? The fancy word for what we've been talking about is ontology. And people have what's called ontological security. They understand the world or they have an understanding of it. And that understanding at some level allows them to cope with it. And, you know, I just keep thinking of uh, in Game of Thrones, the red, you know, the red religion, the Lord of Light, you know, they had the thing, you know, they would say for the night is dark and full of terrors. And their belief allow them to survive it. And the thing is that we all have beliefs about what's dangerous, about what isn't, and it's this cocoon that shields us from the world. And so we also have to deal with other people on a daily basis. We have to have certain beliefs and understandings that, you know, work, allow us to work with other people. And so these things are also important. So there's a lot going on. It's you know, beliefs about the world are not simply positivistic or scientific. They go to deep psychological and social needs, and that complicates things. So speaking of complicating things, Jervis likes to say, look, you know, we're going to see people out there that, from our point of view, will have, quote unquote, incorrect beliefs. Now, very often these beliefs are just, you know, 
we fact check them, I and we could say they are objectively wrong. But there's sometimes they're, you know, and presumably the flat Earth people are wrong, and people that believe that the moon landing was faked are wrong. But there are other beliefs, people, you know, different gods, and so that may be hard to take. And so we might, you know, I, I almost want to put quotes around incorrect, but let's move on anyway. The thing he likes to say is, look, people's incorrect beliefs, even if they are incorrect, they may be sincere and actually sensible in that person's context. They also, in, in terms of investigating them, sometimes they're difficult to take seriously. And sometimes they're difficult for policymakers to grasp. So as, as science, political scientists, we might have difficulty taking these beliefs seriously. Uh, how do we take someone's flat? Or, you know, some of these beliefs are, are, are silly uh, or seem silly. And they also may be difficult for policymakers to grasp. They might just not understand the meaning of these things, right? And the significance of them. So this is a complicating factor. Also, there's a question of ambivalence and unawareness, right? Uh, Half-hearted beliefs can be difficult to identify. When people, you know, they have beliefs, but they haven't all, always, you know, thought them through, right? Why do you believe the world isn't flat? Why do you believe the world is round? And, and sometimes your beliefs about things that there is, uh, you know, factual things in the society that no one has ever questioned. As soon as they're questioned, right? How do you know the world is round? Right? How do you know the moon landing wasn't faked? Right? Um, you probably never questioned these things, so they, you know, you haven't formed them very well, right? And so you may only have half-hearted uh, beliefs about this, uh, and, and and things that you haven't dealt with, right? Again, you may have unformed, or you know, and thus any beliefs you have are half-hearted. Um, and as I just said, widely held beliefs may not be expressed or discussed often, and that can create a lot of difficulty in examining them. It's taken for granted. And so, especially when you're looking at another culture, right, they don't spend a lot of time going over what everyone already knows, but you don't know it. You're not in on the joke, so you don't get it, right? That can be very difficult. Finally, um, People who hold beliefs may only be vaguely aware of them. They may not understand that that's there. Again, if they're taken for granted, if they're widely held, they may not even be aware of the beliefs they have. So of course, the point of investigating beliefs is to try and understand them. And when it comes to understanding them, you know, we have to ask, okay, what caused them? What consequences did they have? Those are the primary questions. But in looking at it, especially when we're, we're trying to understand the consequences, there can be an excess of beliefs, right? There are a lot of beliefs out there and it can be difficult to determine which belief from amongst many was actually causal, right? And so we have a, a, a you know, we have problems like, first of all, it can be difficult to determine what people really believe. That is to say, what is a, you know, uh, you know, what's causing their action as opposed to what beliefs are they tying into to either justify or rationalize their actions, right? Is the belief causal or is the belief something that is used to uh, explain after the fact, right, and, and to add into it. Also, people often hold inconsistent beliefs. And so, you know, this is something you have to worry about, right? And you have to say, look, uh, you can't look at a person's beliefs and then treat them as an automaton. They can often hold inconsistent ones. They can uh, innovate. You know, this is something Jervis doesn't mention, but uh, very often people will, on themselves, they'll, they'll start with a set of beliefs, and then they will think, and they will it, their thinking on the issue will evolve, right? And so that it can also appear to be inconsistent. And another thing is, beliefs can be functional. Now we're going to talk about the functions of beliefs in a bit, but 
you know, he says, look, they can be functional and not depend on reality appraisal. And so reality appraisal is an important concept we want to look at here. So what is reality appraisal? Appraisal in psychology is a, a technical term. It refers to a cognitive evaluation or interpretation of a phenomena or event. Uh, we tend to use appraisal to talk about figuring out real estate prices, but in psychology, it's a particular thing. And obviously, in politics and in the world in general, people are going to be constantly evaluating and interpreting, interpreting a phenomena. Uh, anything that the United States does or a representative of the United States does is going to be subject to interpretation. Why are they doing this? Or, you know, what's their goal? What's the outcome going to be? So appraisal is an important thing. A reality appraisal is about trying to figure out what's going on in the world. And again, Jervis, I start with this. Many of our beliefs are dominated by the need to understand our environment. And almost all of them embody an element of this objective, right? So we are constantly trying to understand our environment. And uh, I think a big part of it is that beliefs exist, right? That, that our existing beliefs in some way have come from that. And so they, they've come from that and they also do that, which creates what we're going to talk about the functions in a minute. So he goes to say, look, in a complex world, personal beliefs are more theory driven than fact based. Now, what's he mean by it? And he means that we don't necessarily look at the facts and derive our understanding of the way the world is, right? We generally will have theories about what people do, what people's motivations are, how the world works. And those theories are, you know, they're simpler because there's so many facts out there, right? And, and actually in science, we use theory to help sort out facts. So, you know, it's probably not surprising that in their day-to-day -day life, people are driven more by their understanding of the causal relationships in the world rather than the, you know, and that's their pre-existing understanding rather than the facts as they encounter them. So that means that people rely more heavily on what they believe than on actual facts to make the sense of the world. And, you know, it, it's getting old now, but Stephen Colbert, when he was uh, doing the, the, the Colbert report, would talk about truthiness, right? That people would, uh, you know, tend to believe things be, even if they were wrong because they exhibited a certain truthiness, as he put it. And that is to say they were consistent with their beliefs and therefore must be true, right? And this is kind of what, what Jervis is talking about. So he says there's four implications of these. Now, these are cognitive biases. And in a second, we're going to talk about motivated biases. Uh, but these are cognitive biases that basically they get in the way of people doing effective reality appraisal. So one, people are strongly influenced by their expectations. What they expect is going to have a big impact on how they interpret the world. Propositions are more likely to be accepted when deemed plausible. So if you say, hey, look, this is a potential reason for this happening, or this, if you suggest to someone, you know, hey, this is what's going on, if they can, if they're plausible, right? That is to say, they're inconsistent with those expectations we just talked about. They are more likely to be accepted. And judgments of plausibility can be self-reinforcing if evidence fits beliefs, right? So as we go along and we see evidence, right? Um, we frequently make the evidence fit the beliefs, right? But we will see things, we find things, and again, the world is full of facts, and in you know in scientific research, we uh, social science research especially, you know every theory has a counterexample. <laughs> this is our thing: is you know if if you have an idea that democracies don't fight one another, right? Uh, you you can find obscure but perhaps valid counterexamples, but 
as a tent, you know, that's because there are multiple causes to things in the world. And we're also talking about people. People make mistakes, right? But your theory will tell a tendency. And it is a very strong conclusion that democracies don't fight. But there's almost always some piece of evidence that someone can glom onto to fit their expectations, their propositions, the things they've already deemed plausible. And he argues that people do not update beliefs in an objective manner as they interpret new information, right? Um, and they tend to, you know, bring in information. There's, there's this idea of base. He talks about Bayesian updating. And if you do a mathematical model of people like they do in economics and game theory, the idea of Bayesian updating is how people, you have beliefs about the way the world is, facts come in and you say, okay, given this fact, what is the odds? What are the odds that my pre-existing belief is correct? And you adjust your belief a little bit, right, accordingly. He argues, look, people just don't do this, right? They look at information and in Bayesian updating, it's assumed that information either confirms, supports, or disconfirms, challenges the existing belief. It, Jervis says, look, people will look at something and even if that fact, if that, uh, that information is disconfirming, they can reinterpret it as actually being confirming, right? People do not, you know, it, do not automatically interpret new information in the correct way, much less apply it to updating their beliefs, right? And so he says, look, there are these cognitive biases that people do not conduct reality appraisal well, right? Because of these things, right? And so this is important. But almost perhaps more important than this is the functions of beliefs, the emotional functions that they play. And that's what we'll talk about next. So the functions of beliefs. As he says, look, beliefs may be rationalizations for policies as well as rationales for them. So there's another good saying from uh, Jervis. That is to say that uh, very often uh, you, you may have a policy and your beliefs may be trying to rationalize what that is, right? Especially if the policy is something that's been enduring, right? Your form of government, your current leader, your religion, your way of doing things, your culture, right? There may be rash, more rationalizations than rationales for whatever people do. Also, I like this one. This is this is actually in this section of this chapter. He starts with that. He ends with this. But the capacity for self-deception, bordering on delusion, enables people to work their way through difficult situations. So he's saying, look, we frequently need to deceive ourselves, right? I mean, the the, the previous section we talked about why it might be difficult to appraise reality and, and quote unquote, correctly update beliefs. Here's like, why would you wanna do that in the first place? Very often your self-deceptions allow you to work with the world and to deal with, you know, uh, the difficult situations people find them in. So what we're talking about here is that, look, we have, there's a link to emotions, there's a link to things like, you know, like I mentioned, ont ontological security and all that stuff, that emotions get tied up in here with beliefs and the uh, need to work with the world to make your way through it. Um, you know, emotions of fear, security, all this stuff get linked in. And so people are motivated to support certain beliefs, right? You're very motivated. If you believe in an afterlife, you are very motivated, especially as you get closer to the end, to believing that. And so you're going to have different biases than cognitive ones. You're going to have a, what we, well, it's called a motivated bias, right? Motivated reasoning means you're trying to get to a predetermined, you're trying to justify a predetermined outcome. So, you know, and he says, look, these are the things that 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 come into play. One, uh, we want to avoid painful trade-offs. When looking at the world, we frequently 
uh, understand that there are some painful trade-offs to be made. And if we can have beliefs that support one thing over another, right, we can avoid the recognition of trade-offs. Another point is that um, beliefs that support policy in, in the government decision-making in groups, beliefs that support policy, and by policy, we could probably expand that to talk about the way things are, the way things, you know, the existence of the group, all, a whole bunch of things that, that we could expand that to be, but beliefs that support the policy that this group is pursuing are going to be defended. Contrary beliefs are going to be dismissed, possibly even attacked. And this is, he, he doesn't bring up groupthink because it's a dodgy proposition, but that concept in, in groupthink is that when policymakers get in there, they get a decision going, a consensus can emerge. And any challenge to the consensus, even if it's fact-based, is unwelcome, right? And people can be cut out and sidelined from the decision-making process because they're promoting contrary beliefs, right? And so it's kind of like in all the sci-fi movies, there, you know, I always say, we're, oh, my wife's watching a sci-fi movie. I'm like, oh my God, what's threatening the earth? Where is the scientist that nobody believed and everyone discredited who was actually right, who can tell them where to put the nuke? Because it's always involves blowing a nuke somewhere. Right? Yeah. But my, this is my point though, that's sci-fi, but this is a problem is that beliefs that support what you're doing, you know, we're gonna defend them. They can, and, and there can be a group effort to defend them, to reinforce them and to support them. Also, as I said, beliefs support the established order, right? And so anytime you have an established order, an established way of doing things, right? The beliefs that underlie it can be sacrosanct, right? And so because they provide ontological security, right? And so you're going to, you know, so any type of beliefs that are necessary to support the order, especially when that order is the individual's rationale for the world, their understanding of who's good, who isn't, of what's going on, their understanding of why people do things. This creates, this is their cocoon of understanding that protects them and allows them to go through the night that is dark and full of many, many terrors. And those beliefs are very functional and are going to be, uh, because of that functionality, people are going to be very attached to them. Finally, um, beliefs produced by action will endure, right? So when you do something and then you rationalize it, right, that rationalization can become the basis for future things, right? And it's sort of like generals fight the last war. Um, or if you ever had that idea that you learn more from failure than success, right? When you learn from success, you, you think, hey, whatever I did was, you know, helped, was right. So let me do it in the future, right? And so you're, if you say, hey, this is why I did this and this is the way the world worked and it was successful, right? Um, that belief can produce future action, right? And and so if, you know, this is why people wear, you know, uh, people wear their, their same jersey if their team wins, right? The next time, don't do anything different, right? Because you believe that what happened there might have had an impact, right? And I don't know if that's a proper thing, but so this can be uh, a, a confounding influence, right? So, Beliefs are functional, beliefs are important. Beliefs are problematic before we even bring in different cultures, right? And so uh, I think though that, that understanding their role, understanding that they're there is important if we're to ever sort out the influences of a cross-cultural environment. Hope this has helped you a little bit towards that.